um, but I'll get to that in a minute. So summary statements and reflections are both ways of communicating to a client that you understand what's going on with them, that you hear what they're saying and, and you're communicating understanding. And these are very specific micro skills that you can enact um, in sessions to sort of pr produce this client-centered mindset. Um, the difference, though, between um, uh, MI, uh, between MI and client-centered therapy is that you don't stop at your oars, right? Because if you just row a boat, it could go maybe in any direction, especially if the client is rowing with you. Um, well done MI doesn't look obvious, but it is directed. And I had a video clip that we don't have time uh, to show. Um, uh, but it's just somebody, uh, it's just somebody, Bill Miller doing MI. Uh, <laughs> just some guy. Um, uh, and it, when you see MI in practice, it doesn't look obvious, it looks natural, it sounds and feels like a natural conversation. But the therapist is actually being quite strategic in what they do. Um, and th this is where the second phase comes in. So remember I said it's a, um, it's a person-centered and guiding method of communication. So it's not all person-centered, it's not all non-directed, it is also, um, this, is a, this is an example of a darn cat. Um, it has nothing to do with motivational interviewing, so that's funny. Um, so darn cat, what is darn cat? The second phase of MI is trying to work towards the, using the reflections, the material that the client gives you, towards building discrepancy between where they currently are and where they see themselves, what they value, what they think is important to them, and where they would like to be. Um, and what you start looking for, once you get a good sense of the client's situation, what you start looking for are these darn cat statements. And these are, this is change talk, is the darn, and commitment language uh, is the cat. So we're looking for people saying things about their desire to make changes, their ability to make changes, reasons for changing, and their need to change. When you start getting that in sessions, a good MI practitioner will start reinforcing and attending to that change talk. Saying, oh, it's, you, you know, your, your drinking is really, uh, you really enjoy it on the weekends, and you're, you're also, though, starting to have problems at work because you're hungover for the first couple of hours every morning, and so you're late to work, and that's something that, you really, that really bothers you. Let me give you an example of uh, res responding to change talk. Somebody's sort of saying, look, I, I think I have to, this is really impacting my life. Question. Sorry, can you say what the acronym is for the change talking? Yes, sure. Desire, uh -huh. ability, reasons, and need. That's for change talk. For commitment language, we're talking about commitment. Somebody's saying, this is something I think I'm going to do. This is something I might do. Um, we're, we're talking about... Um, I forget what the A, I totally was going to remember what the A was and I forgot. Um, but we're talking about things like uh, moving towards taking steps and actually taking steps. Right, so people, so this might be somebody who's sort of investigating different things they could do, or they're saying, you know, next week, uh, you know, I, I'm, I made an appointment at the gym and I'm going to go do it, and then actually taking steps. So this is all, um, it starts with somebody saying, you know, I think I'm going I'm to think I'm gonna cut back on my drinking. Uh, and then there's, thing, there's things along that sort of change spectrum that we look for. How do you get? So the first question was, how do you keep clients from pushing back at you? That's, what, that's when you use your orbs. How do you actually start getting change talk? How do you actually start steering the boat? Um, well, one of the things you can do is start asking evocative questions. You can, so like, you know, what would your life be like if you were, if you were, uh, if you were to change, make a change in your journey? Um, you can use change rulers. Uh, and I don't have time to get into change rules, unfortunately, but that's, sort of, that's uh, briefly it's a thing where you say, well, how important is it to you to make a change um, in your diabetes management on a scale of 0 to 10? And then they might say 5. And the key to that is you, you say, well, I'm curious, how come you're a 5 and not a 3? And what's the natural response about why you're, why you're, why you're higher than you might be? What do people usually give you? They give hope, right? Well, I mean, I'm a, it's important to me to change my diabetes because my toes are starting to get a little bit numb, and that really scares me. Right? So it's really important to me. It's more important to me than to make this change. What would happen if you queried high? If somebody said, yeah, I'm a five, you know, it's a five about how important it is for me to get better at managing my diabetes. They said, really, a five? How come you're not a 10? What are they going to tell you? Discouragement, right? They're going to tell you all the reasons why they can't make that change. So you use these things strategically to try to evoke commitment language and change talk and try to essentially ignore or downplay, not downplay actively, but sort of you attend to less the sustained talk. So there's lots of different things that you can do 
Uh, and, and you know, I'm just giving you the names of these things because it really takes training and practice and exercise and feedback to really get this. Um, so there's lots of different techniques that you can use to get that. And when you get change talk, you want to use your ears. You want to let your ears perk up. My dogs, by the way, are disappointed that they did not get to be in this picture. <laughs> Some of them especially have big ears. Um, uh, you want to use your ears when you hear change talk. You want to elaborate, ask the person to elaborate on the change talk. You want to affirm the change talk. You want to reflect the change talk. And towards the end, when you feel like you're sort of getting it together and you've got a whole sense, you want to give them a bouquet of all the change talk and give it back to them in the form of a summary. You collect all of the reasons why they're talking about making a change and you give it back to them. So, it, you know, hopefully you're getting some sort of a little bit of a sense about what motivational interviewing and the skills of MI might look like in practice. Again, I want to warn you that um, nobody's going to be able to walk out of here and have no exposure and actually do something that looks like MI. Um, uh, and that's sort of the next thing I want to talk about in my last couple of minutes um, here is that learning MI is a long road. It takes time, training, and practice with feedback. And this is maybe the most important thing to understand is if you can't take a workshop in motivational interviewing, and I'm not saying this because it's so hard and it's so special, but we have research that shows that people, when people go to a one-day or two-day workshop, for example, in motivational interviewing, they leave all excited, um, saying they're yes, and using MI in their practice until you look at their video and audio tapes. You listen to their audio tapes, look at their video tapes. And what happens? No changes, or almost no changes, right? Um, they, so they, they learn about MI in these workshops, but unless you actually have somebody watching your in-session behaviors and help, helping guide you towards effective use of your oars, your darn cat, and your ears, people don't generally make changes, or they don't generally make effective changes. That's what our research suggests, and it's not really unique to MI. Most of our workshops on therapy are not really pretty changing people. Um, uh, so you can get lots of CE credits, but it may not actually change your practice. Um, so what are the stages of learning MI? This is a, a great paper by Bill uh, Miller and Terry Boyers. Um, if we're both at the University of New Mexico. What do you first have to get? Well, first you just have to get a sense of the spirit, this collaborative, <coughs> uh, evocative, autonomy-supporting spirit of MI. And then people need to learn and practice their basic orders. They need to practice rowing, get feedback on their rowing. Um, get feedback on their oars. And then they need to be able to recognize change talk. You just got to be able to recognize it first. You just got to be able to understand and identify what, what does it sound like when you have a dark cat in the room. Um, and then people need to be able to respond. They need to be able to use their ears and elicit, learn how to both elicit change talk and reinforce and respond to change talk. Um, we also, as change talk comes up, as people start thinking about making a change, usually because they're ambivalent, um, because most of us, if we weren't ambivalent, we would have already changed. Um, we start thinking of reasons why we're not going to change. So sustained talk also starts coming up, the opposite of change talk. All the desirability reasons and need for them not to change. And you have to learn how to roll with that resistance. Not push against it, but roll with it and get them acknowledge it, uh, 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 reflect it, and get them back on track um, so that they're just making their own decision. Um, developing a change plan is the next phase that you have to learn how to do. And then consolidating their commitment so that when they leave, they're really ready to go with that change plan. And then finally, once you've sort of mastered all of that NMI, then you can learn how to integrate it with other treatment methods. Um, and so I think I'm going to stop here. I have uh, one more slide that I want to show you, um, but I just want to take questions, actually, and just give you, give you a whole bunch of myths um, about what MI is and isn't. But I want to stop, because uh, I think we should have a few minutes left, and take questions that you might have about MI, uh, especially maybe with children and adolescents, but, or generally MI in general. Right, yeah. Good question. Has it been studied with people with intellectual disabilities? I'm not as familiar with that research. That's one thing I might, one, one of my worries, of, of things about where am I might be limited, because you need people to be able to think about what's important to them, to be able to have the cognitive resources to, to sort of make some sort of consistent change. So there might, so somebody with cognitive difficulties, like, you know, maybe brain, you know, cognitive damage, um, uh, it, there might be some difficulties in implementing MI with folks like that. Although I will say, it, as I say that, it does come to mind that I have seen at least one study showing some effectiveness uh, of MI for people with head injury. Um, but there, you know, some sort of cognitive limitation might might be an issue. But you know, I don't know how low your IQ has to be before you can't uh, talk about what's important to you and follow through with that. So I, I, I would sort of be, I, I think for most intellectual difficulties, it would probably be effective. But that's speculation. Yeah. That uh, the 
No, not that I'm aware of, yeah. How do you determine um, Right, that's a good question. Well, I mean, so I think generally with adolescents, you're going to be fine. I think 10 and up, just a, a broad rule, that, that they're going to be fine. You know, between 10 and 12, they start, they really, you know, kids really gain the ability um, to sort of make, to have a lot more independence and more volition and make more changes on their own. Um, younger, and, and part of the reason, the younger than that, Kids have a lot less control over their lives. Um, a lot of the interventions, the evidence-based interventions we're doing with kids, we're not actually doing with necessarily the kids themselves. It's mostly with the parents. Um, so you're thinking like, uh, you know, behaviorally, you know, behaviorally dysregulated eight-year-old, um, maybe with ADHD. That is, MMI is not really going to work, but it's going to work with parents to engage them in a parent training program that's going to help them structure. You know, so you want to sort of think about what's the natural treatment we do for kids, so what's the evidence base for kids' um, treatment, and depending on what the evidence base says, you sort of go, you would follow that. Does, that. does that make sense? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I'll say, you know, I'm not, um, I know it works with adolescents, um, which I would say would be as young as 10, I just don't know the literature as much on children. But I would suspect that most ways it's gonna be implemented with kids would actually be with their parents for parent and family-based interventions. Um, I'm gonna try and remember everything you said earlier. Yeah, I know, I think um, we'll be with videos. It's <laughs> slow down to half speed. Okay. Follow everything I'm saying. Um, you said that um, client change talk at the beginning of the session is not necessarily predictive yeah. of positive change in behaviors later on, um, but if they're saying by the end of the yes. session. So if you're having these short two minute sessions or one session, how can you detect that change that it's such a significant change from the beginning of the session to the end of the session? You mean if they're. Um, you mean, well, I mean, they, like what they've done is minute by minute coding of change talk. Like that, that's how the research has worked. So they look, people might come in with a lot of change talk, but it really, what really matters is what they're doing at the end. And it, I mean, so if you could do 15 minutes, you'd have 15 intervals. Even if they're not, talk. because I don't, I, I wonder if every client is going to feel like they're saying something different just in five minutes. Um, it's, it's, I know, it's surprising, but you can have very brief interactions with people and really, the, the, the idea is that people change for really good reasons. And that, that people who are ready to change, um, uh, change because those reasons become very apparent and the sort of need and desire and all of that stuff becomes really important to them. You sort of reconnect people with values. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of pain in between not being, when, when you sort of recognize where you are and how far away you are from where you'd like to be. And that, in my sense, I don't have any research on this, but my sense is it's that emotional uh, difficulty that's, that's motivating and you can get at that very quickly if you re are really effective with your life skills. It doesn't always work. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really, yeah, it's, I mean, it's really, you know, and, and it, it also depends, like, for the five-minute intervention, this, you're going to get a lot less change talk, a lot less, you know, it's going to be more like a quick healthcare sort of open-ended kind of thing. Yeah, really, really good question, yeah. Um, if workshops and learning MI through um, talks and books and stuff isn't helpful, how do you recommend a practitioner? Great question. Um, so, so you start with workshops and books. Those, that's the starting point. The thing is, so I guess I don't need to be so dismissive. That's not enough. So the, the recommendation is that you find uh, an MI practitioner, an MI trainer, to actually do um, supervision for you, and preferably to actually do coding of uh, audio tapes or video tapes of your session. Because um, what the really the way that you learn MI is having somebody uh, give you feedback on every moment, every utterance that you provide in response to the clients and what clients say, and sort of say, okay, here's what you said, and notice what the client says in response to that. Here's how you might do it in an MI consistent way. Um, even just notice uh, coding people, uh, their open ended versus closed ended questions in a session, number of reflections, uh, number of reflections, two questions, even just doing numbers actually helps people improve. Uh, if, you, if you're going for, if you know what your goal is. So yeah, so, so really what you want is coaching to feed that. And you can get that through audio and video tape. People do coaching over Skype, they do internet coaching, all sorts of stuff. Um, so I think we're out of time, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And feel free to contact me if you have any follow-up questions, email. Um,